And we're back with Digimon Adventure Try Chapter 1 Reunion Part 3. From here on out, referred to as Episode Troll Tashikawa Troll. <laughs> um, so yeah, this... I mean, we're at Episode 3 already. Um, watching through it after how slow Episode 1 was and how fast-paced Episode two was. This is probably my favourite of the four episodes. Um and for reason I'll uh, for reasons I'll get excited over it as 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 we go through. Um so uh, <clears throat> if you've listened to my original chapter three review, you already know why. If you've read the review on my WordPress, fightgunandfight.wordpress.com, you'll know as well. And with the shameless plugging out of the way, um, just in time for the episode to start proper, um, the seven teens and their Digimon are in the back of a military van, as it would seem that the MIB are obliging enough to give them a ride home after all. <laughs> um, Matt wonders who the woman driving them is, and Sora thinks she looks pretty scary. I don't know about scary myself, but eh. Taichi's just glad they're getting home safely, as Mimi wonders where Joe Senpai and Gomamon are. Go uh, TK responds that he doesn't know, Tai speculating that something stopped him from coming. Um, Sora reasons that it is his final year, after all. Um, Mimi repeating that statement before she catches Izzy looking intently at her, a little blush on his face. And as she catches him, he looks away, his blush growing bigger. Um, Mimi asks him what's wrong, and he replies that it, it, it's nothing. And Mimi's expression changes into a rather smug look as she asks Izzy, What? Have I gotten so cute that your heart is racing? Troll, Tashikawa! Troll! <laughs> um... Izzy insists that that's not the case. It's not, but Mimi just giggles and tells him she was kidding with a wave of her hand. Izzy's blush grows stronger, and he quickly changes the topic, asking if Mimi came back to watch Ty's soccer game, as she had mentioned it earlier before. Oh, I remember. Give me the airfare, she demands of Taichi. Uh, Ty reeling back in shock, Mimi continuing to laugh at them all and stating that she's joking, continuing to troll the other six. I mean, just troll, Mimi, troll. Um, uh, she's, I love this interpretation of the character, I really do. But on a more serious note, it turns out that she'll be back in Japan for a while uh, because of her dad's work. And she asks that everybody takes care of her, let, uh, everyone letting out a, Whoa! Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's a translation thing, or maybe it was shortened, but when Mimi asks everyone to take care of her, she winks, which to me said, looks like she said something to tease and troll them a third time, but uh, the reaction seems so overblown if she's just back home because of her dad's job, so I don't know if there's a piece of text I'm missing there, but it was... Uh, for the subs, it was, oh, I'm I'm back home because of my dad's job, so everybody take care of me, okay? And everybody goes, what? It's, yeah. Um, so I don't want to say uh, troll me, me troll again, because uh, I, I, I want to say it, but the scene, I don't have enough t context to justify it, um, just because the reaction seems so overblown. But anyway, as they're driven away, we see that Kate Digimon again, and... If before it even turns to face the camera, I can tell you it's Hackmon, um, a recently introduced uh, child level Digimon, or rookie level. Back at Joe's, he's studying at his computer when he sees a headline on screen saying unidentified creatures spotted at Haneda Airport. He has a flashback of him brushing off some of the MIB that came to collect him from his college, um, and then he hears a knock on his window. He pulls back the curtain. And it's Gomamon! He opens the window and they hug and Joe cries a bit. And this, like, watching this back a second, third, fourth time, it still tugs at the heartstrings. You you really do get a sense of how lonely Joe is. Um, 
and it's sad. Like, and I, I don't say that disparagingly or to insult the character. He perhaps unwittingly blew off the chance to help his friends against the Quagamon because of his studies, because of his studies, and Gomamon still came to get him. It, like the moment is brief, but it, it really is touching. Um, you know, or the, the fact that, and this is something that from previews of chapter two will be expanded on. So remember, I said before I had a point of contention with Joe, and that continues, but what I know now, going forward into chapter two, it really just makes this moment that that much more powerful. I mean, I love it. It's Again, the moment is brief, but it's it's rather touching. So, we cut to see another disguised Digimon running through the apartment blocks, and the scene fades to black. So, it's the next day in a disheveled Odaiba, the news station is reporting on the unidentified creatures that caused major damage in Odaiba and at Hanada Airport. Although, miraculously, there were no reports of anybody being seriously injured. All Hanada Airport flights were suspended and transportation was seriously affected. The news reporter goes on to say, as Sora watches in her kitchen, that serious action needs to be taken and that this same creature has appeared a few times in the past, each time causing serious damage. Obviously, they mean Greymon, as uh, Izzy's web browsing shows a post asking, what the heck are they? Are dinosaurs alive or something? And that would make sense. Greymon has shown up in the real world in Season 1. He showed up in the real world in Season 2. So, you know, and so Digimon are an event that happens every couple of years um, in this continuity. So, and... It's kind of cool in a way that they're finally acknowledging that with this series, that there is a um, consequence to being a Digidestin and to having a partner Digimon, and that it, it, it does get noticed. Like, the first series, and I feel to an extent even the second series, sort of glossed over that aspect. You know, it was typical sort of monster shows up, heroes save the day, city rebuilds, life goes on. Typical sort of television. Um, this turns that on its head. Um, yesterday's outburst of several monsters at once created even more damage and served as a reminder of their menace and destructive power. And each of the group are watching as they get dressed or out of a shower or frying eggs at the Yagami, or Kamiya residence. Tai is staring angrily at the television, annoyed that the media is treating their friends just as they would the enemy. Agumon's clutching a pillow as he watches, sad like Tai about it, since they fought against Kawagamon, not not alongside. The the government have called an emergency cabinet meeting, while the police and self defense forces are working together on a response. And in the meantime, Mrs. Yagami is hanging out the laundry, turning back to Agumon and Tailmon and saying, Oh my, there's nothing scary about you little guys, right? The subtitles don't show it, but she seems to say something more along the lines of, Oh my, there's nothing scary about Agu-chan and Tail-chan, right? The Digimon cheering, Right! While Mrs. Yagami says that they just don't understand, cheering the Digimon up as they cheer again on another, Right! So, I mean, that's nice that, like, Tai's mom is just like, Oh, they're back! Okay! And continues to go about her daily business. I think that's just... Um, I, I just love that. But the whole situation seems to have Tai Chi bummed out as he runs into Matt after school. And they're making their way to Nishijima's office when they hear some classmates say that somebody's dad was injured and hospitalized because of what happened at Haneda. Matt urges Tai Chi to ignore them, and when they reach Nishijima's office, it's empty. The professor is nowhere in sight. They ask around but report to Izzy and Sora that Daigo's just not in today. They're, inter they're interrupted as Mimi appears. She's enrolled in the school as of today, in first year, the same class as Izzy. And she informs them with a twirl and a w she informs them of this with a twirl and a winking pose. Um, the girl behind her sneezes and were formally introduced to the girl Tai met back in the first episode. Well, 
almost. She gets embarrassed that the others caught her sneezing, and she runs off. We're told she's a new transfer. Uh, Mimi speculating she'll be in the same class as Sora, as she's a second year. So the bell sounds, and Mimi asks a blushing Izzy to escort her to class. He agrees, and the two part from Ty, Matt, and Sora. Sora says she heard that both the soccer game and concert were postponed. Um, just until things settle down, Matt responds. Maybe Ty follows up. So we cut to a classroom, and there's a name written on a chalkboard. The name Mako. Mako, as we now know, uh, Mako is the name of the new girl. Um, Mako Mochizuki. And I'm just like, really, Mochizuki? I mean, all I can think of are actual m mochi treats, but Mochizuki is a, a name in mathematics, I think. Uh, so it doesn't appear to be a gimmick name yet. Maybe uh, it really depends. You'll you'll see where we get there. It it could be a play on something, but I think they were just going for alliteration. Uh, but we'll see when we get there. Anyway, so Mako transferred. Uh, to Odaiba from Totori, and she's a timid girl with dark hair and glasses that seems to get nervous easily. She's perfect waifu bait for some of you out there, I'm sure. She moves to her seat beside Tai, and the two share a glance. <laughs> and I can't help but wonder if us um, disgruntled, shall we say, Tyora shippers would ever... If we'd ever sacrilegiously <laughs> um, consider Tycho or Meichi as a replacement ship. Just <laughs> just throwing it out there, guys. You know, look, we know how the Tai Matsora thing ends, so maybe Tai and Mako could be a thing. You know, maybe. But, uh, so we cut to the schoolyard. And two students are discussing what happened with the Digimon. They say the situation is irritating, and that they hope the monsters will all just hurry up and die. That's harsh. Like, anyway, so, Matt comes storming out of nowhere. And I mean, like, out of nowhere. Like, unless he was hiding in the shadows or something, waiting for somebody to say something bad about Gabuma. He just comes out of nowhere. And storms up to the two students, but he's stopped by Ty. Um... Matt's getting upset that Ty won't let him speak his mind to the students. The students have caught on. And Ty just tells him it's nothing and he grabs, he just leaves. Uh, or, sorry, they, the, the students leave. Ty then tells Matt that they can't be getting upset about it. Matt grabs Ty's collar. But before the situation, before which I'm just getting flashbacks to um, Adventure One when the two of these would fight all the time. Um, but before the situation can escalate, Sora interrupts them from above, staring angrily down at them. Matt lies and says it's not there's nothing wrong, but Sora knows that it's obviously from this morning's news. She proposes that the eight meet up after school. And we see a shot of the Fuji TV studio again, and that disguised Digimon from earlier is hiding, watching what's going on. Ooh, um, so seven. Uh, so we uh, the next scene, seven of the eight have assembled under the bridge at the boardwalk. Um. But Joe does manage to arrive, uh, Mimi rushing to hug him with a huge, Joe senpai, you made it, and stuffs a bag of gummies in his hands. Um, a flustered Joe comments that Mimi hasn't changed. Sora apologizes for pulling him away from his studies. Joe tells them not to worry, and that he also had something to tell them all. But first, let's sort out the situation. Izzy has made a summary of six recent events. First, the gate to the digital world has been closed off for at least a year. So it's um, exposition time as we're getting filled in of what happened between the defeat of Malomyotismon and where we currently are with Tri. So the gate to the digital world has been closed off for at least a year. 
Secondly, for some reason, the Digivice has been malfunctioning. Thirdly, a regional radio disturbance, mainly around Odaiba, uh, has been followed by a mystery blackout. Fourth, uh, the radio disturbance brought down all but the wired networks, per which meant poor reception for cell phones, radio phones, and TV broadcasts. Fifth, for unknown reasons, space has been distorted, which created a new non-gate connection to the digital world. And that's how the Digimon got into got back to the real world. And sixth, the Digimon emerging through these distortions are all new to them. They went through some unknown mutation, and Izzy suspects that all the events were caused by the distortions in the curvature of space. Initially, initially Izzy didn't know why the first two had happened, but, but now he's convinced that it's all related. The distortions were likely caused when the digital world was connected to the real world. Um, Izzy, Izzy goes on, but the group tunes out, uh, discussing that Nishijima never turned up at the school today and how terrible it is that the media is treating the Digimon so badly. Uh, Matt says he'll have his dad file a complaint against them, and Joe comments that they're whipping up attention through scare tactics. Um, Ty remarks, though, that some of the reporting is true, Gaining not-so-friendly glances from Joe and Matt. Um, yeah. Uh, Ty, <laughs> um, Ty goes on to say that Odaiba and the airport were totally destroyed by a Kuagamon. He saw the site, so he cannot... <sighs> Sorry. He saw the site, so he can't... But Ty is cut off as Mimi pipes up that it would have been far worse if not for Agumon. Matt agrees, and still nobody is listening to Izzy, as who's just continuing to ramble on and ramble on as everyone else sort of talks around him. <clears throat> Matt says it's wrong to blame their Digimon friends for what happened, and that he won't accept it. It's not... <clears throat> Sorry, it's a, it's not a Digimon story without some. Well, it's not a Digimon adventure story without some time map confrontation, I suppose. As Matt urges the silent Tai Chi to say something, stopping what's going on is only something this group can do. He wonders if Tai Chi has forgotten their adventures in the digital world and what they accomplished. Tai says he could never forget. But he freezes up upon trying to convey his feelings. If if ties be, and this is before I go on. This is I think is what I like most about the adventure try story. Um, the group are changing. They're growing up into individuals. Their personalities are changing. How they would have acted five years ago is different to how they react to situations. Now, Ty is sort of realizing the weight of the burden of being a chosen child. And Joe is to an extent too, and we'll cover that in a later discussion. But Matt almost wants it to be sort of same old, same old. And TK and Kari are sort of realizing that they've got their hands full with how their big brothers are, are acting and how they'll have to keep them in check. So I love this, the growth and development of the characters. However, they might have overdone it with Ty a little bit. And I'll I'll touch on that in a. I'll, I'll touch on that in a while. Believe me. Um. So, if Ty has become so vulnerable, then Matt's had enough. There's no point to this meeting. There's no point in carrying on. They should just do things their own way. Matt leaves and Ty leaves. Um, TK and Kari telling Sora not to worry, and they'll talk to their big brothers later. 
So, Sora proposes going home, but Mimi is incredibly hungry and wants someone to get something to eat with her. Joe has to study, because of course he does, and, but Mimi reckons the break would do him some good. Like, get away from the studies, chill out, hang out with your friends that you haven't seen in a while, and go back with a fresh head. And that makes sense. <laughs> Joe laughs it off. Um, it wouldn't do him any good, he says. He doesn't even have time for his girlfriend at the moment. And everyone freaks out. Girlfriend? Joe? This even snaps Izzy out of his ramble. Mimi can't believe that Joe has a girlfriend. And TK, with the cruelest line ever, asks if she's even human. Uh, Hikari, in complete agreement, says, with me, says that's a horrible thing to say. But Joe, Joe insists he's not lying. He's the oldest of the group, so he has the first right to be happy. So Mimi just mockingly tells everyone else to believe Joe. With this sort of... The faces like to sort of... Yeah, okay, fine, we'll believe you. It's, it's, it's hard to describe it. You need to sort of watch the scene, but it's just like this. I'm going to say I believe you so that you shut up, but I don't believe you. And everyone else makes the same face, uh, mockingly saying that they believe Joe, but Joe knows better and gives out to them for it. You don't believe me? And it's just the continuation of Mimi be, uh, becoming this big troll, and I, I just I love it. Commercial break, or at least the black eye catch thing. Um, so we're at the midpoint. Um, so I want to hear. I want to rant about something that was bugging me at the time of writing this, or even at the time of recording the original review. That that bugging feeling is still there. But I feel like we'll actually get an answer for it in Chapter 2. So it's not as bad, but there's been no clear answer given so far. And there isn't one given or even hinted at in Episode 4. So this is still a point of contention for me. Why have Ty and the others not even considered that Davis and, his, and the Zero Two Quartet might be able to help. I know that the Zero Two Quartet were seemingly killed off at the start of Episode 1, but TK and Kari still have their D3 Digivices, not the originals. So some aspect of Zero Two has to have carried over into this story. I mean, their names were on the MIB computer. And... Cody's, for an animation error or not, was on there twice for Yggdrasil's sake. So, why has it not been questioned why TK and Kari have different digivices? Or, oh, there are four other people that might be able to help us out with this issue. Maybe we should contact them. But I'm not the big, and I'm not the biggest advocate of of Zero Two. Uh, that show fell apart immediately after the defeat of the Digimon Kaiser. Immediately. Um, like, it retconned its own canon, it changed stories mid-focus, it went above and beyond to just ride itself into holes that it couldn't get out of. And it was a mess of a series after the defeat of the Kaiser. Um, I know there are people out there that like it, and that's fine. Good for you. Awesome. Enjoy what you enjoy. I'm not going to take that away from you. No one can. But to me, personally, from a writing perspective, Zero Two is a mess. It is a cluster of just inconsistency, incontinuity, and just apathy for the viewer. An apathy for its own, um, for its own universe. But Unless they're in some, unless there's some sort of alternate continuity in play here, like when Alphamon killed off the, or, you know, defeated the original, four, the other four, they were wiped from the memory of the original eight. Unless there was something like that in play, it makes no sense why the main eight wouldn't see if their four friends could help them with this situation. You know, or 
why the MIB didn't bring Vmon, Hawkmon, Armadillomon, and Wormmon to see them. There's just... <clears throat> that just bugs me. And, as I said, I'm not an advocate for Zero Two. 2 um, I, I don't like it as a series. It has moments here and there, but overall it just does not hold up as well as Season 1. And I, I don't mean to sound Gen 1-er here. I mean, my favourite season is 5. So I'm far from a Gen 1-er um, in terms of Digimon. But, God, it just... There's, there's an unexplained inconsistency at the moment. I feel in Chapter 2, we're going to get the explanation. Um, but at the moment, it's just a glaring flaw that I've had a few people ask me about and a few people have pointed out on social media. And I'm just, or even in discussion with friends. And But it is annoying that nothing's even alluded to to say, we haven't forgotten about this, we are setting up for it. But anyway, I digress. Back from break. And we get what is quite possibly the best part of the episode. The girls run into Palamon, who's disguised as a human. And they wonder where Beomon and Telmon are. So Palamon points to them. Telmon is licking her paws and grooming herself like the real cat she's sitting next to, while Beomon is acting like the two pigeons she's hanging with and pecking the ground for crumbs. It's a, just a genuine laugh out loud moment, and the first time uh, the first time you see it, especially since it just sort of comes out of nowhere, um, and really turns the whole dressing the Digimon up like humans to sneak them into somewhere. It really sort of turns that plot point on its head, because um, that was something that was maybe overdone in Adventures One and Two. But so anyway, the the six end up in a manja restaurant, and Mimi really enjoys the manja, having missed it while she's been in America. The Digimon love it too. Sora attempts to talk about Ty and Matt's fight, but Mimi says to leave them be, and she then teases Sora about not being able to leave it, since both Ty and Matt have grown into such handsome men. Sora's face flushes and her eyes widen, even Kari looks a little surprised. <laughs> troll, Tashikawa, troll. Um, but Sora then quickly goes back to eating her manja as Palmon asks what handsome means. Biomon doesn't get it. So Palmon asks what she prefers. And Biomon can't decide. And Tailmon then. <laughs> and Tailmon then states that Biomon prefers headsome. But Bio states that she pr likes the footsum. <laughs> I'm just... I like even thinking back on it. Like, all I do is laugh at that scene. Like, that these... That these child Digimon have no concept of human interaction or, you know, and rightfully have no uh, idea about human mating and growing up and attraction and, and that end of things. That... You know, oh, I don't like handsome people. I, 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 I don't like handsome Digimon. I prefer headsome or footsome Digimon. And it's, it's, it's a moment where like you, you wonder because Tailmon's tech an adult level Digimon uh, or champion level. All right, but she, at times, has the mentality of a child level Digimon, probably from hanging out with seven child levels. But you have to wonder. Like, are they just trolling the other girls? Or is that, gen is that genuinely their understanding? Either way, it just it makes the entire scene that bit more hilarious, and I love it all the more for it. Um, so Mako walks by the restaurant, seemingly looking for something. Um, and... And we carry on from what has to be the best part of the whole, for the best parts of the whole episode. Uh, from the acting like real animals to, I mean, what could only be the three female Digimon poking fun at the, by having their own girly talk. It's just, as I said, it's all just very laugh out loud funny. 
I, I'm, I, I really enjoy it. So, it's, um, so we cut again, and it's sundown, and we're back in the school. Uh, Ty finds Matt standing outside Daigo Nishijima's office, and this time he's, and this time he's there. Nishijima, he works for the Incorporated Administrative Agency, National Data Processing Bureau Information Strategy, Strategy Section, Information Management Office. He is Grade 2 Management Officer, Daigo Nishijima. Yeah, as I said last episode, it's basically Hypno or Dats. Um, being an agent of the I-A-A-N-D-P-B-I-S-S-I-M. You know what? Let's stick with Men in Black. Yeah, let's just stick with the Men in Black, or the organization. <laughs> being a member of... Being an agent of the organization is his main job. He then tells them that distortions have emerged between the digital and real worlds. And up until recently, the organization had been handling them. But now, more powerful Digimon are turning up. So, it's more Dats than Hypnos, and I'm okay with this. They call the Digimon who come through Infected Digimon, real original, as some powerful force has infected them, as was speculated earlier. Uh, the Digimon lose control, and they run wild. Ty wonders if there's a way to change them back, but Nishijima says the organization hasn't found a way yet. All they can do now is prevent further damage and drive them back. Matt wonders how much they know, as they even know about the Chosen Children and their secret. Daigo explains that after the incidents in Hikari Goaka and Odaiba, more people know about Digimon. And a walk-in named Jenai gave the organization their information. This led the organization to make an organized study of Digimon and form the organization. And for those <coughs> sorry, for those wondering, yes. The Jedi they show is the silhouette of his zero two younger Obi Wan Kenobi form rather than his older adventure form. So, could the Digimon who's not actually a Digimon be making a proper appearance in future episodes, I wonder? I really hope so. It's just, with the way things are now, it's a shame uh, Miyako or Yoli won't be around to see him. <laughs> um, excuse me. So... Sorry, I thought I was going to sneeze there. Probably should have paused and come back to it, but... Oh. We, get, um, we get an odd shot of TK and Izzy cycling with the Padabon and Tentamon before cutting back to the organization's offices. Foreign countries are demanding information about Digimon, but there's no new information to provide. And the woman from before is unable to contact Jenai. She gets a phone call from Daigo, who tells her that he passed it on to the children. <gasps> AIDS. Okay, maybe that's in bad taste. And anyway. Then, we cut back to see TK and Izzy have cycled to appear. And TK is confused, as he thought he was going to help Izzy with clothes shopping. The little fashionista TK has become. Uh, Izzy explains that he meant online shopping, as he has trouble with store clerks, and usually his mom would buy his clothes. So, of course, Izzy would find shopping online easier. Tentamon wonders if there's no special reason for this newfound interest in fashion, but TK immediately sources that Mimi is the reason, and Izzy turns bright red, Patamon giggling at him. Uh, Izzy's developed a dress-up software that mimics his body size and shows DK a variety of different outfits. Um, and Tentamon just cries. He's never, never imagining the day he'd see Izzy looking for fashionable clothes. Uh, Patamon comforts Tentamon, telling him not to cry. 
And it's like, ah, oh, his little kosher Ohan is growing up. It's 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 a cute moment, and along with the funny moments, this episode is sort of filled with those um, tie-in Matt drama aside. But it's about to get a bit more serious. So we cut to a riverbank, and Ty is staring silently onto the water. Agamon calling to him to try and get a response. He doesn't really get anything. The disguised Digimon from before is watching them. Um, but this is this was the one. This was the disguised Digimon running through the apartment blocks earlier, not Hackmon. Um, a red thunderbolt booms behind this Digimon. We cut to Matt's room, and he's trying to play the harmonica, but he can't get into it. He can't focus because of Ty and the person he's become. And he then wonders if everybody in the group will change um, the way Ty has. And then we cut back to the riverbed. Ty tells Agumon that and Matt hasn't changed, and Ty can understand why Matt is mad at him. He thinks maybe that he himself is wrong, and asks Agumon what Agumon thinks of the situation. Agumon doesn't know either, and the two hug tight. Because I mean, for the because I mean, Agumon's power comes from Taichi's courage, Taichi's self-confidence, Taichi as a person. You know they. They share that power and that energy. So if Ty doesn't know what to do in a situation, it makes sense that Agumon wouldn't know either. That like the the idea would be foreign to him. You know, so, I, so it's, it it makes sense. With uh, Ty, then admits he's scared. Um, the, the holder is a crest of courage. He's not just scared, but he's terrified. He's destroyed so much without even knowing it. Not just building, but people too, as we see a broken and crushed cell phone. He wonders if maybe he'll end up killing somebody. Agumon, shud uh, Agumon shudders, Ty wondering, or ga he shudders and gasps, really. It's like a, <gasps> Tai Chi, no, sort of thing. And Ty wonders why he's even rambling on. Unless there's the two hug again. It's like, it's a really depressing moment. Um, but we're starting to get sort of more of an insight into what's turning in Ty's head. And if there's anything I've loved about Try so far, again, it's the character development. And seeing characters grow up. And change from who they were in Zero Two from who they were in, in Season 1. So, it's the next day. Ty, Agumon, uh, Kari, and TK are outside an office door. Kari wonders why Agumon is here when Tailmon and the others are waiting at home. Sora and Biomon are already there, as are Izzy and Tentamon. Matt has something on so he couldn't make it, and neither can Joe, because Joe... Um, and this is Izzy's much vaunted office. Really? This is the first time in this, in three episodes, it's been mentioned. So I don't know how vaunted it is, but okay. And the bell rings, and Tentamon answers. Mimi and Palmon have arrived. So it's just Tailmon and Panamon who are at home. Way to be jerks, guys. Way to be jerks. Um, Mimi is very surprised to hear that this is Izzy's office. Izzy says he's helping out a firm that his American friend started. And I'm just wondering, is this Wallace? Or Willis? Please let it be Wallace. Let Wallace be in this story. I'd love to see his Terriermon and Endigomon again. Even if that story is, even if that story is not canon to the actual adventure story, I would love to see uh, 
Wallace Willis pop up again. I really would. But um, anyway, Mimi's quite impressed by him, and Tai Chi relays everything that Nishijima told them. Uh, and by them, I mean uh, he and Matt. Izzy then shows off his latest invention. Tentamon opens a laptop and shoves Agumon and Biomon through the screen. Yep, through the screen. Tai and Sora panic, but Tentamon switches on the giant TV to show that they're okay. Izzy has created... Now, this is Izzy who was on a 2005 flip phone in episode 1. He has created a virtual cyberspace within the office server. It's an evacuation strategy for the Digimon in case of an emergency. And for whatever reason, I should note that on Izzy's desk, there are six monitors in stacks of two. Six monitors! Just... I use two in work. And this guy gets six. What? Anyway, so from within this cyberspace, the Digimon can text their partners or communicate through the monitor. Or communicate through the monitor. They can't call though, as phone call processing is too slow. However, if Izzy can use his laptop to connect monitors connected to a network, the Digimon can slip in and out of cyberspace. And we sort and and then we get the end credits. And this is a slower episode, more like the first one. Uh, it's a slower build. Plot points are being, you know, expanded upon and built up. And seeds are being plotted for down the road. Uh, the Izzy Mimi ship is being built rather nicely. But speaking of Izzy... With all he accomplished in this episode, and this will carry on in episode 4, wait now. Um, with all he accomplished in this episode, imagine him with technology in 2015, or now 2016. This story is set in 2005, and he's creating virtual cyberspaces, accessible through televisions and other monitors. That's some Digimon Cyber Sleuth shenanigans right there. Cheap plug, watch out, February 5th, my Digimon Cyber Sleuth uh, PS4 playthrough begins then, so keep an eye out for that. So, in this episode, like the first, there wasn't any action, but there was a lot of drama, tension, and character development. I understand why, in the Japanese previews and cinema viewings, the, um, there was a, a lot of, let's call it concern, uh, concern about Taichi's personality, that he was too wimpy or too cowardly, or you know he's not what a, a, a hero should be. But personally, I like this turnaround, because as I said before, it shows that he's growing up and thinking more. He might be terrified now. But he'll grow out of that. Um, and that growth is what sets him apart from the other six leaders. I mean, let's. If I go through them, right? Tai, tai of Digimon Adventure was always stubborn and headstrong. But he was caring and looked out, from the, looked out for the group. When he made a mistake, <coughs> Skull Grey Mom, it, it shocked him for a while. But he learned from his mistake, and he grew up and became a better leader for it. Daisuke, in Digimon Adventure Zero Two, or Davis, was worse than that. He was brash and arrogant at times, on top of being stubborn and headstrong. And he never really did anything to learn a lesson, or screwed up in a major way. I mean, the whole reason he's able to beat Malome Odismon is because he doesn't have any fear or worries about the future. And I'm just like, no, that is bull roar. Just no. Just 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 no. 
like so Davis never goes through um gogglehead initiation. You know, he never there's never an event that's his fault that he has to recover from. And then on top of it, he just gets to wave off the final bad guy's main uh, warfare tactic. And people wonder why I take issue with Davis. <clears throat> anyway, so then you have Takato of Digimon Tamers. He was a lot more timid, a lot, a lot more baby-like by comparison to the other two. Um, but he, he, he thought about things before he reacted. Yeah, he was a bit of a doormat, but he grew into the leader role and became stronger and had his own Skull Greymon moment with Megidramon after Leomon died. Um, but got over that, strengthened his bond with his partner Digimon, you know, and, and became the better for it. Takuya, um, for Digimon Frontier, was very bold and headstrong. He could be stubborn, and he was, but he was more of a fiery Tai Chi. Similar to Davis, he didn't really. go through a issue that was his fault. I mean, the closest, if I recall correctly, is that he lost control of his fusion form the first time he used it and blew up a mountain. But he was always there for his friends. He protected them to the end. Yeah, he might have stole the spotlight a bit, but our next um, entrant is... Uh, guilty of that way more than Takuya. <laughs> um, but Takuya had, again, grew into his role. He became, through adver uh, adversary and through challenge, he became a very respectful gogglehead. Um, say what people will about Digimon Frontier and how it changed the formula too much, as if the trading cards in Tamers and the Evangelion-like storyline wasn't changed enough from Adventure and Adventure Zero 2. Takuya was a great gogglehead. Um, and then we move into Season 5 with Masaru, or Marcus, in Digimon Savers, or Digimon Data Squad. And you don't get anyone as arrogant, as stubborn, as brash and as angry as Masaru. I mean, this is the guy who would fight other Digimon with his bare fists, with or without his partner, and win! And win! I, I, like... And, and much like Takuya, Takato, and Taichi, he had his own off-the-rails moment with Shine Greymon Ruin Mode that, rever re that resulted in his partner being returned to a Digi-Egg with the fear that when the Digi-Egg hatches, the Digimon that hatches from that Digi-Egg might not even know who Masaru is. Those bonds could be eternally broken. Because Masaru let his emotions get the better of him. And in the Savers world, evolution is achieved through pure emotion. Uh, through pure human emotion. You take that human emotion and you turn it into something tangible called the Digisoul. Or DNA charge. And you power your Digivice with it, and that enables the evolution of your partner. Masaru went overboard with his anger, and forced his partner to evolve into um, a new mode that he just couldn't handle the power of, and the Digimon self-destructed. But Masaru learned from that. He grew up. He 
was the first then to um, get the correct to have that evolution go the correct way. You know, uh, he did whatever he could to rekindle the bonds between him and his partner. And then you have Taiki um, of Digimon Cross Wars, or Mikey of Digimon uh, Digimon Fusion. Taiki is a general. That is his official title, general. Uh, he leads the Cross Heart Army, or Fusion Fighters. So, with that in mind, he had a militant general's mind. He was always coming up with new tactics on the fly. Um, he had a plan B, a plan C. He was almost Batman level crazy prepared in some respects. And he never went overboard. You know, he never had his own dark evolution. But his partner, Shoutmon, made up for that. Shoutmon was the human uh, leader that you're more used to, the brash, the arrogant, the confident, the overconfident, the uh, punch first, ask questions later. And the two of them grew to understand each other and to bond and connect as the show went on. And Shoutmon gained access to new um, forms and more Digimon joined Taiki's army and more humans um, fought alongside him. So there is, like, even when it's not done the traditional way, there is a character growth there for both the human and the Digimon. There's a, there is an arc there. And then we get to Tagiru, the Taiki wannabe from Digimon Cross Wars, the young hunters who leapt through time. Whether you class this as Season 6 Part 3 or Season 7 is up to you, with um, Adventure Try then being Season 7 or Season 8, depending on how you class Young Hunters. Tagiru is to Taiki what Daisuke is to Taichi. Times 10. There is nothing redeem redeemable about the Tagiru character, except maybe his theme song. It's like they took Davis and they said, how can we make this worse? And Tagiru was born. It doesn't help, he's an absolute creator's pet as well. There's no life lesson, there's no uh, growing into a leadership role, everything is just handed to him. Even in the, uh, even in the amazing uh, six series crossover, where all the goggle heads come together, everything is just handed to them, and and that's where my issue is with the characters like Daisuke and Tagiru, and that's but it's why I also love characters like Taiki, Masaru, Takuya, Takato, and Taichi. Because through this new series, Taiki's char Taichi's character is still growing, still evolving, still maturing. Where for the moment, the other characters, we don't know what happened to them. We don't know what became of them. But we're seeing how Taichi's life is carrying on, how it's continuing. And what is going to drive him to become the person that we know becomes an, an ambassador uh, for Digimon and human world relations. And I'm excited to see that. There's... There'll be something I bring up in the episode 4 review. And... I mean it with the best of intentions. Um, but it, it, 
because it's also pertaining to Tai Chi's growth. But it's something that the it's something that the episodes do that almost borders on parody. Um, so we'll see when we get to the episode four uh, recording. And I'm at this for nearly an hour. Um, that's how much there is to talk about. Um, so I can't, I can't stress again how annoyed the lack of mention of the Zero Two Quartet makes me. But as I said before, allude to them. Do something to show they haven't been forgotten and build up toward what we have an idea might be coming in Chapter 2. Um, the drama between Matt and Ty was really well done. And the shenanigans of Palmon, Telmon and Beomon just made the episode for me. So with that... So with that... I bid you guys adieu. If you've lasted the hour, thank you so much. And I look forward to talking to you again in episode 4. And by all means, please like, favorite, comment, subscribe. And I look forward to hearing your reactions or hearing your opinions and thoughts in the comments below. Take care, and I'll see you soon.